Grace, mercy, and peace are ours from he who is, he who was, and he who is yet to come. Amen. Life should be easy. Do you believe that? Yeah, I, I don't think any, many of you believe that that is true, right? Sure, we, we would like to have our lives to be pleasant most, if not all the time, like a ship sailing on, on calm seas, but you and I know, and I've said it already today in the service, that our world is fallen, it's full of trouble and hardship and problems and suffering, and, uh, and so yeah, it's, uh, life is not easy. We have storms in life, we might say. But uh, maybe something that we struggle with a little bit more is is that if there truly is an all-powerful and an all-loving God, then why would he not just allow hardship and struggles and problems in our life, but that he would actually lead us into those storms, that he would purposefully bring storms into our life that would cause us to suffer and and go through hardship and problems. Why? Why would an all-powerful and all-loving God do that? What's he up to when he's doing that? That's what we're going to look at today as we look at a section of Scripture from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. We're going to actually see Jesus lead his disciples out into quite literally stormy waters. And we're going to ask, what's Jesus up to when he's doing that? And hopefully, my prayer is that all of us will see, all of us will see that and help grow in this truth that Jesus does give us what we need to face the storms of life. Like I said, our text comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. If you look at uh, Matthew's Gospel and and the way that he was inspired to lay it out, chapters 14 through 18 has a lot of Jesus teaching his disciples, preparing them for what would lie ahead for them in their lives, right? They would eventually take the Gospel out into the world and help build the church. And just prior to this section that we're going to look at, Jesus performs an incredible miracle. He fe- and you've probably all heard of this miracle. He feeds over 5,000 people with just a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And the disciples, they recognized what an incredible miracle this was because it says in the scriptures that they picked up baskets full of leftovers after the, the miracle was over. The crowds, they also recognized what an incredible miracle this was. And John's gospel tells us that they were so impressed, they were so uh, incredibly amazed at how he had provided for them. It says that they wanted to take Jesus and force him to be their king. That is the background that leads us up to our text for today. Again, it comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter 14. It's in the worship folder if you want to follow along. You can also pull out a Bible if you prefer that. It'll also be up on the screens. I'm going to go through the lesson a couple of verses at a time, and then I'll stop and and make some comments. And then when we're done, I'll I'll share some insights for you. So let's begin. Uh, Let's start at chapter, or verse 22 of chapter 14. It says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. And go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. It's very possible, stop there, it's very possible that Jesus, the reason it says he immediately dismissed the disciples and the crowd is because he was a little concerned that that attitude and what the crowds wanted to do would influence the disciples 
And he was not that type of a king, so he wanted them uh, to leave that area. And he himself also, it says, went up on a mountainside to pray. Uh, he too was maybe getting away from the crowds trying to influence him. He often, Jesus went up on a mountainside or went away by himself to pray to his father. And maybe he prayed in that moment, Lord, give me the strength to, to overcome these temptations. Because he had temptations like you and I do. Maybe he thanked God for the strength to dismiss the crowd and, and get out of that situation. We don't know, but he went up on a mountainside to pray. Uh, meanwhile, while that's happening, he, wh what did he lead the disciples off into? Well, it's, it's stormy weather, which was common on, it's, it's actually the Sea of Galilee, that storms would come up on that lake and often very uh, forceful, very severe, and the, the disciples are battling against this all uh, much of the night. Uh, it, it says that they were a considerable distance from shore. Uh, again, if we look at John's gospel, he says they were about three or four miles from shore, which if you think about it, if they've been paddling and rowing all night, that's not very far. Uh, and that just tells you how strong the wind and the waves were fighting that they were fighting against. Uh, let's, let's move on to, uh, to the next verses. So, verse 25, it says, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. <clears throat> it's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Just in case anybody here is not sure, yes, this is a miracle. <laughs> this, this is not... Jesus uh, finding some shallow water to walk out to the disciples or a, a thick kind of marshy path to follow. No, this is Jesus, the Son of God, displaying his divine power, showing his power over the wind and the waves to his disciples. He's walking on the water just like you and I would walk on this floor. It's a, an incredible miracle by Jesus. And that's why the disciples freak out, <laughs> just like you and I would, because they're not expecting to see someone walking on the water. Plus, they're, they're tired. They're exhausted from rowing and paddling all night. It's still dark out. Uh, they're fearful already from the wind and the waves. So, uh, yeah, they were not expecting it. In fact, uh, they, they probably, you know, ah, it's a ghost! cried out in fear when they saw Jesus. I know, it's kind of it's funny, but it says they cried out in fear. They were terrified. But what, is, what does Jesus do? He says, verse 27, but immediately Jesus said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Jesus it says he immediately did it. He wanted to make sure that they were okay. He says, guys, don't be afraid. It's not a ghost. It's me. It's Jesus. It's your friend. It's your mentor and your teacher. You don't have to be afraid. And it's, it's important to point out here that this was at least the second time that Jesus had shown his control over the wind and the waves. Prior to this, Jesus, you may remember the account where Jesus is with them in the boat, same lake, same kind of storms. Jesus is asleep, and they wake him up, and he calms the storms. So imagine the relief that the disciples had when they realized that it's Jesus. It's Jesus, right? And they feel okay. All right, let's go on. Verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Is it any surprise that Peter's the first one to speak up and respond? Right? We know that Peter was pretty headstrong and pretty impulsive and not only that he responds to Jesus but hey Jesus let me come out on the water with you but is this just another impulsive kind of foolish move by Peter is it something more than that I think it's more than that 
If you look at his words, it, it translated here, the Greek is translated, it, he says, if it's you, but it could also be translated, in fact, maybe better translated, since it is you. So this is an expression of faith by Peter. When he sees that it's Jesus, when he realizes it's Jesus, he wants to be with him. And he doesn't care how he gets there. He's willing to step out of a boat into water, onto deep water, to get to him if he has to. So what before was superstitious fear about this person is now a daring, powerful faith. And Jesus recognizes that. And he says, come. He sees that this isn't just a, a foolish uh, move by Peter. It's not just him trying to show off in front of the disciples. So he says, come, Peter. And then something really, really incredible happens. In fact, it's almost hard to imagine, isn't it? Put yourself in that spot. Imagine yourself stepping out of the boat onto the wind and waves to walk out to Jesus. But he does. He steps out, and not by his own power, but by the power of Jesus, he starts walking on the water, despising the wind and the waves. It's incredible. But how long does it last? Let's, let's look on. Verse 30, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Peter's faith gives way when he turns his focus away from Jesus and he starts looking at the wind and the waves around him. Instead of holding on to his faith and holding on to Jesus, he lets go of it. And like I said, he takes his focus off of Jesus onto the danger, onto the wind and the waves, and he starts to sink. I think it's worth pointing out that this is an experienced fisherman, very likely a strong swimmer. So notice that he doesn't automatically think, I'll just start swimming, the first thing in his mind is, there's nothing I can do here. I'm in trouble. I'm sinking. Lord, it's a simple prayer. Lord, save me. He knows, he knows there's nothing he can do. He says, Lord, save me. And Jesus, without hesitation, <laughs> reaches out his hand and grabs Peter and, and lifts him up, lifts him up out from the danger, out from the waves. But he does say something to Peter. He says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And uh, some Bible scholars would say that this was a, a kind of a strong rebuke of Peter. Uh, could be, it could also be more, maybe a, a, a more gentle correction of Peter. Jesus saying, Peter, <clears throat> the reason you sank is because you are weak in faith. Because you didn't, instead of holding on to your faith, you, you got caught up in the wind and the waves and you started looking at them and you started doubting. And Peter, you have no reason to doubt because I'm right here. I'm with you. And obviously, I have power over this, these wind and waves. So you, Peter... He had no reason to doubt. Let's look at our last couple of verses. Verse 32, And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It's no coincidence here that the winds died down. Jesus calmed them. It's another miracle. Just like he had done before, Jesus calms the, the stormy waters and the wind. He had brought them out onto the lake to, to teach them something. That lesson is now over. So there's no more need for the wind and the waves, so he, he calms them. And the people in the boat, they are completely amazed and overwhelmed in a good way 
with this incredible God-man that is with them in the boat. And so they do what is only reasonable to do when you've encountered someone like that. They fell to their knees in the boat and they worshipped him. They didn't care that they were out in the middle of a sea. They didn't care that they were in a boat. They were going to worship this man, this God-man, and the incredible things that he had just done for them. So, so what things can we take from this? Hopefully you've, you've already been thinking about some things as we read through this account. And there's many, there's many things we could take away from this. I just want to share a few with you this morning. We first learn a couple things about doubt and about fear. The first thing we learn is that the devil loves to attack us with doubt and fear, especially when we are going through the storms of life. When we are fighting against problems, when we are struggling with our problems, when we are in the middle of suffering, when we feel like we've been fighting all night against wind and waves, that is when the devil loves to come with doubt and fear. So don't be naive. Be on your guard. Know that the devil loves to attack you with doubt and fear when you're going through struggle. So I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what's in your future. But I can guarantee you, you will face storms, and maybe you're facing some storms right now. So be on your guard, because the devil will try to attack you with doubts and fear. The other thing that we learn about doubt and fear is that although doubt and fear is very typical for us as human beings, it is not pleasing to God. God does not want us to have doubt and fear. That's why Jesus said what he said to Peter. And doubt and fear come for us when, like Peter, we quit focusing on Jesus and his words and his promises, and instead we focus on our problems, right? The illustration in the children's message is a great illustration. I know you've seen it probably some of you ten times, but it's a great illustration. When we focus on our problems, we sink. When we focus on Jesus, we walk. When we focus on our problems, we sink. When we focus on Jesus, we walk. So when you focus on the doctor's report, When you focus on your financial uh, spreadsheets and the problems that's going on there, when you focus on the problems that's going on between you and your spouse or between you and your kids and your marriage, or I mean your marriage and your family, when you focus on the health problems you're dealing with, you fill in the blank, right? When you focus on that, you sink. When you focus on Jesus and his word and his promises, you walk. And, and like Jesus, well, he didn't say it to Peter, but I was implying it, right? We have no good reason to doubt. We have no good reason to doubt. I mean, how many times have you and I been in this church, like we are this morning, listening to a sermon... Or how many times have you read your Bible or been in a Bible study and you have heard God say to you, I am with you always. I will always take care of you. I will always provide for your needs and protect you. I love you. Nothing can separate you from my love. I forgive you. I have heaven waiting for you. And yet we still get worried. (laughs) We still doubt and fear, and sometimes we let it consume us. That is not pleasing to God. Thankfully, we also learn some things about our Savior when we are struggling with doubt and fear. 
The first thing we learn is that when we are struggling, when we're in the storms of life, Jesus does not leave us alone. But he comes out to be with us in the storms. Just like he did for Peter and the disciples when they were out on the lake in the middle of their storms, Jesus comes out to be with us in the storms. And let's remember who it is that comes to be with us. He's the one who walks on water. (laughs) He is the one who silences the wind and the waves and the storms. He is the one who is in control of all things. He is the one who comes to be with us in whatever storms we're going through in life. And just like he did for the disciples, when we're going through the storms, when Jesus comes to be with us, he wants us to hear his voice over the storms, saying to us, it is I. Do not be afraid. I am with you. The final thing that I want to share with you today that Jesus does for us when we're in the storms of life is that when we are sinking, when we start sinking in our doubt and in our fear, Jesus will be right there to reach out his hand and to lift us up. Without hesitation, Jesus will save us. Now, he may not save you from further problems or trouble. He may not remove the storms, but he will lift you up. He will lift you up so that you don't sink deeper into anxieties and depression and and problems with, with the struggles that you're going through. He will lift you up so that you can stand of over the problems, so that you can walk over the problems, trample those problems with the strength and the peace and the hope that Jesus Christ gives you. And you know what? We, we can trust. You can trust fully that Jesus will do that for you, that he will save you when you're sinking in your doubt and your fear. You know why? Because Jesus has an incredibly flawless track record of saving us. When mankind was overwhelmed with temptation and sin, when mankind was sinking ever closer to the depths of hell, Jesus, without hesitation, left the shores of heaven, came down to this earth, and walked on the stormy seas of the same life that you and I do. And without being asked by anybody except for his Father alone, Jesus walked perfectly through those storms for you and me, and then he reached out his hands, both of them, on a cross, and he died there for our sins so that we would be forgiven, so that we would be saved, so that we would be lifted up to a new life, so that we would have heaven waiting for us. Jesus has saved you. So he will certainly save you in whatever storms that you are going through right now. So when you're going through the storms, when you're sinking, just cry out like Peter. It's a simple prayer. Lord, save me. And Jesus, without hesitation, will come to you. And he will reach out his hand and lift you up. You remember how I said earlier that towards the beginning of the sermon, that Jesus, during this time of his ministry, was helping his, to teach his disciples and helping them grow, and he was prepping them for what lied ahead for them, the, the sharing of the gospel and the building of the church. Well, you know what lay ahead for those disciples. More storms, more hardship, more trouble, and they would eventually face the greatest storm that they would ever face, death. And for Peter, that meant being crucified, just like his Lord. Well, not 
not just like his Lord, because he said, crucify me upside down, because I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Savior. In this account, Jesus is teaching Peter that he may not always remove him from the storms, but he wants him to, he's teaching him to walk in faith and in trust through those storms, all the way through the greatest storm, death. So could you and I leave here today taking away from this account that same lesson that he taught Peter? That storms will come, and sometimes Jesus will even lead us into those storms. But Jesus does not leave us alone in those storms. He is with us. He's helping us. He's guiding us. And he will save us. And that when that final great storm comes for you, for me, for whenever that is, Jesus will be there with us again. And he will take us to the heavenly shores to be with him forever. May God give all of us the faith to do that today and always. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.